So Rogério Rosenfeld can't be here today. He's in Belém, so I'm substituting for him. So this is, of course, uh, part of a weekly colloquium series, but it's also um, during the workshop that uh, we're organizing this week on QCD parameters. So Diogo Boito is one of the main organizers, and we're very happy to have lots of people from other places here visiting. So um, the colloquium today, we have the pleasure of having uh, Professor uh, Shoji Hashimoto from KEK. Uh, so he's one of the leaders in the field of lattice QCD. Um, he did his PhD at University of uh, Hiroshima. And uh, we're very pleased to have him here to tell us about uh, simulation of the vacuum and matter in a Fento box. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be here because I, I made it after two long distance flights. I, I arrived yesterday. I'm still a little bit uh, affected by the jet lag. But anyway, um, I feel like I'm sympathetic to, to Brazil that because my my mother told me that I have an uncle who immigrated to Brazil some 80 years ago. So that, that, that's before I was born, and actually even before my mother was born. But, but he, he was in, in Brazil. Uh, he, he was in Brazil. It's no longer here. But I think it was the, the state of Panera? Parana. 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 Which is the next to yeah, Zamparo. And and I heard that he, he has two two children. So so I actually have some cousins in, in this country nearby. So so I, I feel like very very friendly to to, to Brazil. Um, today I'm I'm going to talk about the, the Lattice QCD and, and this is a very general introduction to, to the Lattice QCD. And the Lattice QCD is actually um, a, a method to, to calculate the, the various quantities related to the quantum chromodynamics. And this is a one-page advertisement of, of the Lattice QCD. Welcome to the new world of QCD. As, as many of you know, the QCD is a very difficult nonlinear theory, and it's not easy to calculate any uh, interesting, important quantities. But now we have a device or a method to, to calculate uh, the QCD non perturbatively from the first principle. We, we need a supercomputer, but, but still, um, we, we are able to calculate many interesting quantities. And no extra assumptions necessary other than the QCD Lagrangian, that's good. Up, down, strange, and even charm core groups included. And wide range of applications, including hadron masses, decay constant, the scattering amplitude, and so on. And arbitrarily high precision as you require that, that we can prepare. But it, it doesn't come for, for free. Uh, and, and the delivery can be on time using cutting edge supercomputers. And, and so if you are interested in, you can, you can ask me. I can give you a quote. That, that could be $100 for, for some easy quantities that I, I can simply copy some papers to <laughs> give you, you some papers. But for some more complicated quantities, I, I can give you the quote of uh, $100 million or something uh, that I, I want to use to buy my supercomputers. And then it takes some time to, to get the right answer. But, but anyway, there, there is a method. So, so that is the subject I, I want to describe in, in this talk. So, so the crucial question here is that can we really expect to get correct solutions from the lattice QCD?
calculation or the, what are the potential errors. That, that is important. We are spending a lot of money on, on our calculations. So, so how much we can trust those calculations, that is a really crucial question. And this is my, my former boss at, at KK. He was an experimenter. He was a boss of the uh, Super Kamiokande experiment. When, when I went to him to ask some, some money to buy my next supercomputer, okay, let's say $20 million or something, he, he asked me, and, and, and I argued that I can get, like today, <laughs> I, I argued that I can calculate your favorite quantity, and for him, the favorite quantity was the, the matrix element of the relevant to the proton decay, because the super Kamiokande experiment is the proton decay experiment. So, so he was interested in that matrix element. And so, so I, I said I can calculate the proton decay matrix elements, and such and such precision can be obtained. And he said this, we experimenters stake our life on the systematic error. Do you? Um, experimenters so all, always working very seriously on estimating the, the systematic errors. And there is, uh, well, we, we are serious, but more like, okay, your systematic resume, oh, 10%, or well, something like that. That was not enough for him, uh, for, for me to, to justify my $20 million or something. So we have to be very careful about what kind of systematic errors we can, we can have and uh, what kind of precision we can achieve. So, so my, my answer to that question was, was not really clear at that time, but we now believe that uh, we have some or, or very good confidence about our calculation. Because the, the, in, in our calculation, the, the background that, that we based on is very solid and, and there is a very solid theoretical framework that is the quantum field theory. And, and there is a well-defined theory. We have a Lagrangian and a partition function that defines the quantum theory. And, and there are several uh, exact, exact relations that is obtained from the symmetry. And more importantly, the quantum field theory is, uh, QCD is a renormalizable quantum field theory. So, so model itself is highly restricted and, and the, there is no freedom to choose and the continuum limit is always the same one, the unique. So in, in many computational uh, physics or computational biology or something applications, there, there are this kind of process happens. You, you first make your model and do the calculation and looking at the result, you adjust the model and do the calculation once again and adjust the model to obtain the better and better result. But it is not the case. For, for the QCD, we, we have the unique theory. Eventually, we should get the, the, this QCD and we are uh, improving. By improving the calculation, we can improve the precision. That is the difference from, from many other computational applications. So it's important to understand uh, the errors. And uh, there are, of course, practical limitations due to the limited amount of the uh, computational resources, limited amount of money. Because of that, there are discretization effect, finite volume effect, and so on. But one may theoretically understand how the error behaves. And, and by, by using the numerical experiment, one can confirm that the, uh, the systematic error actually behaves as we expected. Once we can confirm it, uh, uh, somehow we can eliminate it from the, from the calculation. And, and the final result could be more precise. That, that is the ideal situation that 
in, in many calculations, we can we look at the individual sources of the systematic errors and we, we try to eliminate. Then, then we obtain the very precise number in the end. So that, that is what I want to, to emphasize today. So let me start from the, from the QCD. QCD is, is defined by this Lagrangian. There, there is a Lagrangian and there is a partition function that defines the quantum field theory. That's it. And this is the, the model that, that we need to, to calculate. It's an SU3 gauge theory, and because of the renormalizability, the, the terms that appear in the, the Lagrangian is, is just this, so nothing else. And so, so we, what we have to do is to, to put this on the lattice and do the calculation. So the lattice QCD is the version that we define the same theory on the four-dimensional cubic lattices. And we put the field, uh, field variables on, on the lattice point or, or, the, or the links that connect the, 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 that nearby uh, neighboring lattice points. And we choose some lattice action that approaches uh, to the continuum one when, when I take the, the lattice spacing to, to zero. In, in doing that, I have many choices, but, but because of the, the renormalizability, any choices should come to the unique solution, unique answer, which is QCD. And we do the numerical calculation by the Monte Carlo method. I, I do not talk about any details about the numerical computation of that. There are a lot of things to do, but, but in principle, you can do it. The important the point for you may, may be that what kind of input you need for, for this calculation. There are several input parameters. The number of that is it's the same as in the number of the fundamental parameters in QCD. One is the QCD coupling constant. And on the lattice, that is setting the coupling constant is equivalent to setting the lattice spacing. That is related by the, the renormalization group. So, so this is one parameter. And for individual quark masses, I, I need an input parameter for up quark mass, down quark mass, strange, strange and charm quark masses. I, I need the input that those are the pi on mass, k on mass, and j psi or epsilon. Those are the uh, input parameters that, that I have to use. But all the other quantities that, is, that comes out from the calculations are the predictions. Well, we need, we need some extra parameters when, when I introduce Q, QED or, or the weak interaction. We, we need the, some more parameters, but uh, within the QCD, this is everything. Once we, we input those, the, a few parameters, then, then we get all the other important quantities with the help of the uh, black box that is the, the huge the supercomputer. I do not explain what is happening inside, but anyway, by using the supercomputer, I get some number. And this is from, from Christian's group. Christian, where is, I don't see. Anyway, <laughs> and BMW, Budapest, Marcel, Wuppertal collaboration did this nice calculation some years ago. Some 10 years ago, they, they obtained the, those, the spectrum of the uh, lowest lying hydro masses. Yes, please. So you yes, everything is in Euclidean. And how do you know you have the right number of parameters? It tells you that you don't need an extra parameter. How do you know you, the... You listed the, some parameters, but who told you that that was enough? Who told you that is enough? Uh, nobody told me. <laughs> um, I, I'm sorry. Actually, this is the the parameters that, that we we need. If you write down the Lagrangian, 
Nothing else. I, I, you put directly the quark masses or you put some meson masses in between? We, we put the quark masses in, in, the, in the calculation and to tune those parameters until, they, uh, until the pion mass or kion mass is a uh, uh, physical pion or kion mass is uh, reproduced. And then you fix the, the, that parameter. So there's six parameters for the quark masses. Is that what you need for the six? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, if you like to include the top quark, there are six parameters. And, and the, the coupling constant. That's it, yeah. So from there, the spectrum is obtained. Uh, mesons and baryons, all those are uh, nicely reproducing the experimental data. On the right-hand side, the mass splitting between the isospin different uh, baryon masses, uh, proton and neutron, neutron mass differences there. there. In order to, to obtain that, you have to include the QED, and you have to include the uh, mass difference between the up and down quarks. But if you do that, you can actually obtain the, the, the mass differences of those baryons. Those are all consistent with the experimental data. That sounds wonderful. And for other quantities, uh, uh, those are also ma hadron masses from other, another group. And uh, here, the, the, the plot includes the heavy mesons and heavy, yeah, heavy mesons, including the charm and the bottom quarks. And the decay constants, there, there are many different types of mesons. For all of those, there, there are decay constants that characterizes their decays into to the lepton pair. So those are the, the single number associated with that meson that characterizes their, their certain type of decay. And there, there are experimental measurements and the lattice calculation actually reproduces the experimental data quite, quite nicely. And also the scattering phase shift this is about the uh, isospin one pion pion scattering phase shift calculated on the lattice. And in this channel, you know that there, there is a raw meson uh, in, in, the, in the real world. And uh, the calculation ha has been done at the slightly different pion masses. So, so they, are, they are not just on, on the, uh, the real world the phase shift, but by extrapolating the data to, to the physical pion mass, they obtain this, this curve that actually uh, reproduces the physical raw meson phase shift. That, so, so the raw meson mass is, is, is around there that the phase shift becomes pi over two. So all those are the nice examples that the lattice QCD after the very, very complicated calculations, one can, one can reproduce what, what is uh, observed in the experiment. So in order to trust those calculations, we, we need to understand the errors. Uh, the, the obvious one is the, the discretization effect. We, we define the theory on the Euclidean lattice so, so it's not the continuum space. So, the, so there must be some error associated with that. And, and if you pr prepare a very precise, uh, very fine lattice, you, it looks like this, but, but by having uh, coarser lattices, you, could, uh, you must approximate the, the real thing by those coarser lattices. So, so what happens to, to the final, final results? And, and there is a crucial question of how small uh, lattice spacing you, you need to obtain the reasonable or, or precise numbers. And, that, and the tricky or important thing is that this is a quantum theory, so, so the all possible uh, wavelengths may, may contribute. You know that because of the quantum fluctuations, even if the, your fluctuation is all at very short distances, you can't simply ignore it. 
that that is a part of the important physics. And, and so, so there are physical length scales and unphysical length scales. The QCD is is very difficult because there are several uh, physical length scales starting from the up and down quark masses of about 3 MeV, and the, the QCD scale is something like 300 MeV. And if you include charm quark in the calculation, that is has the mass of 1.5 GeV. And if you want to include the bottom quark, that, that, that has 4.5 GeV. So, so this is a multi-scale problem. So it's, it's very challenging to, to put everything on the lattice and do within the single calculation to, to get the, the final solution. Because you have to cover the, the very tiny wavelength scales and also the very long wavelength scales. And also, the important thing is that because of the renormalizability, those the unphysical uh, fluctuations or, or the very short distance fluctuations can be uh, renormalized into the into the coupling constant. So, so you don't really need the arbitrarily small lattice spacings that that the kind of effect can be uh, included in the the choice of the uh, parameters or, or the coupling constant. So, so this is the 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 summary of the of many lattice simulations in the world. It's already five years old, but the people did a lot of the lattice simulations with the different lattice spacings A as in the unit of Fermi, and with the different quark masses. A uh, quark mass is, uh, finally has to be tuned to the pion, physical pion mass, uh, to, to reproduce the physical pion mass, which has 135 MeV, but, but the directory doing that is uh, technically challenging. So, so people do the simulations at the other heavier quark masses or pion masses and eventually want to extrapolate to, to, to this point there. So, so people did this many lattice simulations, and in, in the end, obtained the continuum, uh, continuum limit. And in doing that, you have to take the uh, continuum limit. That, that is a sort of extrapolation of the existing lattice data. And that can be done by, with the help of the, some uh, theoretical knowledge about how the discretization effect behaves as you go to the smaller and smaller lattice spacing. That is the semantics effective theory that is essentially describes how, what, what kind of the discretization effect actually may arise in your calculation. That is to describe by adding the irrelevant operators in, the, in your Lagrangian and that reproduces the discretization effect. So, so the irrelevant operator could be something like this, those uh, keeps rotational symmetry but breaks chiral symmetry, or, or some other operators may, you may consider, but that it, doesn't, it breaks parity symmetry, so, so actually it doesn't exist. So, so in this way, and by introducing the extra uh, operators into the Lagrangian, you can uh, estimate, or you can understand how the, the systematic error de depends on the lattice spacing A, which, which appears in front of the, the operator. So it's, it could be order A or order A squared, depending on the, on the symmetry. And the, here is a, is a bad example of the discretization effect. This is uh, uh, hyperfine splitting of the charmonium. So, so JSI and the eta C mass difference by using uh, some uh, standard lattice formulation, I obtained something. This is my pilot calculation. I, I actually obtained this, this very st strong dependence of, on the lattice spacing. So, so the question is whether you trust this extrapolation. I, I don't. So this is a bad example, but, but if you find something like this, you, you need to 
um, try to improve your, your lattice formulation or, or go to the even smaller lattice basics. So this is what example what I did, and, and you have your question. Uh, I, I'm sorry, 90 degrees rotations here. And some other people used some other lattice formulations, and again, the, using those, the same quantity has this strong A squared dependence, like, like this one on the, on the left, and on the, on the right, yet another lattice formulation. Again, you have a very strong uh, Lattice spacing dependence, so so it's very important to to have multiple uh, lattice spacings to to obtain the continuum limit. But by, by the way, this this band is the experimental number. So in order to to approach that point, we you need to have the very fine lattices for the, for the charmonium mass spacing. But this is the kind of worst case for for many other. Uh, Light hadron quantities, the discretization effect is, is not that big. And this is actually the example for the nucleon mass, or, I'm sorry, nucleon or delta, the masses at some particular uh, quark masses. And, and depending on the lattice spacings, the, the result doesn't change so much, so, so the con extrapolation to the continuum limit is a kind of a trivial thing. So, so if you see it, you can trust that this uh, discretization effect is well under control. Okay, that's about the discretization effect. Now, now you have the finite volume effect. Unfortunately, I have a limited the lattice size because of the lack of money. Uh, Sorry, um, limited computational resources. So, so it's like the situation is like this. I, I put the nucleon on the lattice, but because of the finite volume, the nucleon may be distorted in this way. Uh, this I, I stole from somewhere, but it's it's weird because the orientation of those C is uh, somehow 90 degrees. Uh, Rotated, so so it can't be the the right thing. But but but, but anyway, um, the lattice simulation and the small lattice is something like this. Well, 90 degrees uh, rotational symmetry is still maintained, but, but but anyway, it's it's like this. Your nucleon is uh, squeezed in in some way. So in this situation, you don't expect that the very precise calculation is possible. So, so how large should we take in practice? Uh, that can be estimated by using the help of the chiral effective theory. Again, this is the quantum theory. So the, there, there are corrections from, from the nucleon emitting the virtual pion and absorbing it once again. So, so it produces a loop like this, and estimating this, this loop in the continuum, or, or, or I'm sorry, infinite volume theory and the finite volume theory, and see the difference. Uh, you can see how, uh, what kind of the finite volume effect you would expect. And you, you will see that the difference is, behaves as the exponential minus mass times the, the, the length of the lattice. And the people actually confirmed that the behavior using the, the, the real simulations. And those, those are the exponential uh, curve. And by, by doing this, uh, re repeating this calculation at the several uh, lattice sizes, uh, you can actually confirm that this is exponential. So, so you can safely take the, the limit of infinite volume. And then, the, by looking at this, you can, you can trust that we, we are controlling the effect of the finite volume. So there, there are systematic errors. The who cares? These days, the reviewing the recent lattice results 
is easier than, than before because of the flavor lattice averaging group that, that summarizes the, the most recent lattice calculations for various quantities and provide the, the lattice averages of that. And that is regularly updating in 2010, 13, 16, and this year. And we are already discussing about the next edition. And this, we assess the ability of controlling the systematic errors, including those of the discretization effect, finite volume effect, and so on. And in doing that, we, we look at individual lattice computations and see that see whether the parameter values that is taken by that particular lattice computation and the ranges of that uh, allow for a satisfactory control of the systematic uncertainties. If there are several points of, the dis of different lattice spacings, okay, you, you have a control on the discretization effect, and so on. And if there is so only one that is spacing in this calculation, then you are not able to uh, control the discretization effect. Then you will get the red tag. In, in that way, we summarize the many calculations uh, according to the chiral extrapolation, continuum extrapolation, finite volume effect, and so on. And if, if, all, if there is no red tag, that particular calculation is included in the, in the final average. This is, by the way, about the pi on and the k on decay constant. And finally, uh, provide the average of, the, of a different lattice calculations. And, and to finally get the result like this. Now the pi on decay constant is calculated in such and such precision. And k on decay constant is such and such. And now it's, it's really precise. I don't remember the numbers, maybe 1% or even less. That, that is the, the current situation. This, this kind of averaging procedure has been done for many different quantities. So those are the, the basic uh, lattice calculations. And I spent something like 30, 40 minutes. OK, here. For, for some amusement, I, I look at some, something else. Issues of lattice formulations. Uh, the problems in, in the lattice calculations, uh, many of them are in the fermion formulations on the lattice. The, the gauge field is much easier theoretically and computationally, and, and the fermions are, are much more complicated. So the, the one of the reasons is th that fermion is more complicated is, is the, the axial anomaly. That is the famous uh, phenomena in the quantum field theory. If you have the symmetry at the Lagrangian level, that is called chiral symmetry, but that symmetry is broken by the quantum effect in the theory. And that is called the axial anomaly. And the uh, axial divergence of the axial vector current is related to the FF dual, or, or here, GG dual. That is the, uh, that characterizes the topological excitation of the, of the gauge field. So some, some nice way it connects the, the topology of the background gauge field and the fermions. That, that is the radiation coming from the axial anomaly. And the lattice theory, in, in, in the lattice theory, it's not trivial to, to treat this type of the, of the anomaly. And, and there are several ways to, to reproduce this. And uh, well, anomaly is the violation of the symmetry. So, so the, there are ways to, to respect it. One is to violate the chiral symmetry from the beginning. That is called the Wilson fermion. One is to violate the flavor symmetry. By the, by the way, the anomaly is only for the flavor singlet sector. So, so violate uh, the flavor symmetry is one way. 
And then the, another way is, which is close to the continuum counterpart is the preserving chiral symmetry on the, on the finite lattice spacing, on the, on the lattice at finite lattice spacing, and that is broken by the, by the quantum effect. Those are the domain wall fermions and the overlap fermions. And there are several choices. So why do we care? The violating the chiral symmetry is a bad thing because the, without the chiral symmetry, by the way, the chiral symmetry is the symmetry for the massless fermion. So without the chiral symmetry, you don't know where is the massless point. So if you do the a simulation using this Wilson fermion that violates the chiral symmetry, you look at the GMOOR relation, you, you know that pi on mass squared is the, um, approximately proportional to the quark mass, so you, so you, can, do, you can make a plot or something like this. And also you can also make a plot of the, uh, you can do a measurement of the quark mass using the, some uh, word identity they, they seem to agree uh, at the same point goes to zero, but very, if you look at very precisely, they, they don't really agree. They, they don't really come to, to zero at exactly the same point, so, which means that by, by going very close to the chiral limit, the where is the, the massless limit is a crucial question. That, that is about the, the formulation violating the chiral symmetry. The formulation violating the flavor symmetry has another sort of problem. Here, the, in the massless quark limit, the pi on mass squared actually goes to zero. That is fine, but this theory is weird because it has many pions in it. It's not just a pion, a single pion, it's actually 16 pions in it. And the other pions have a heavier, significantly heavy, heavier masses, and they don't go to, to zero. And there are, you see there, there are many points there. So for instance, at the, the typical lattice spacing, when the pion mass, phys, physical pion mass is 135 MeV, uh, then the heaviest, uh, at the exactly the same in the exactly the same simulation, the heaviest pion has that's 320 MeV. So, so your, your simulation contains the, the real thing, but it also includes some unwanted degrees of freedom that has to be uh, eliminated from, from the simulation. So that is the problem of the, the, of the staggered fermion that is is another uh, popular uh, formulation used in many lattice calculations. And, and in this, I, I've skip, probably skip it, in, in, in this uh, staggered fermion formulation, in order to eliminate those un, unwanted degrees of freedom, you, you do some artific artificial procedure, and that is not really uh, theoretically rigorous, but one uh, assumes that it's okay in the continuum limit. That there is a related issue of the topology, and I said that the axial anomaly is related to the, the topology of the background gauge field, and that has a more interesting relation between the fermion and the gauge field, that is the mathematical theorem of Atiyah Zinger, its index theorem. Index theorem tells us that the number of the fermion zero mode in the, in the particular background gauge field is related to the topological charge of that gauge field. So, so the gauge field topology and the number of fermion zero mode is related. That is a mathematical theorem. And the, it is not just academic theoretical question, but it's a physical uh, consequence because the, there is a banks cashier relation that relates the chiral symmetry breaking and the number of the near zero mode. So, so those zero modes are actually relevant to the physics of the chiral symmetry breaking. 
So, so the topology in the background gauge field is a very important quantity. Without having the topological excitations in the background gauge field, you don't have the chiral symmetry breaking, you don't have the uh, GMOR relation and, and many other important relations for the, for the pions. So, so it's very important to, to check if our calculation actually reproduces the topological excitations in the vacuum. And we know that the, the topological susceptibility is proportional to, to the quark mass. It looks like this. The, looking at the topological excitations of, the, our, of our lattice simulations, it actually like this. I forget. Blue and the red corresponds to the positive or negative topological excitation in our in our gauge field. So actually, in our background gauge field has this type of the uh, excitations, bubbling excitations. And after averaging over, over those, we, we may obtain the various physical quantities. By the way, associated with those uh, uh, topological excitations, there are fermion zero mode. Those are the relevant to the chiral symmetry break. So the topological susceptibility is an important uh, quantity, but this is very, very difficult to calculate using the uh, staggered fermion that, that violates the flavor symmetry. The top, uh, topological susceptibility has a very, very strong uh, discretization effect. You should look at this black dots that has a very strong dependence on the lattice spacing, and only after going to the very small uh, lattice spacing, you can, can cannot obtain the continuum limit. And using the Wilson fermion that, that violates the chiral symmetry, it's even worse. And now it's uh, plotted as a function of the quark mass, and it doesn't really show the uh, expected behavior that is uh, proportional to the quark mass. But only after taking the continuum limit, it follows the expected relation. We, we have the uh, simulation using the chirally symmetric lattice fermion. By using it, it certainly goes to the, the zero as you go to the quark massless limit. But, but the signal is not that clean compared to other calculations. So, so depending on the fermion formulations that you take, uh, there, there are different uh, problems, but in any case, you need to take the continuum limit to obtain the final result. By the way, this is the chiral, chiral condensate by counting the number of the near zero mode, and uh, we finally obtain the chiral condensate, uh, which is uh, close to the nominal uh, belief of, of the size of the chiral symmetry breaking. Okay, now let me get back to the, to the main track of understanding the, the errors. Um, finally, I, I also mentioned the, uh, another important source of the, the error, that is the statistical error. We, we, in order to extract, the, for instance, the hadron masses, we use the correlation function correlation function of two, two operators here and there. And that has, the, by, by going to the longer and longer distances, the correlation between those two operators exponentially drops. And uh, the rate of the exponential drop actually uh, gives you the hadron mass. So, so how, how, how rapidly the correlation vanishes that is related to, to the hadron mass. So we, we measure the, that, that kind of correlation function, but, but on, for the same correlation function, there are contributions from the excited state. The, it only, uh, only defines the, the quantum numbers, but it's not particular state. So, so th there are piles of the of the excited states. So, so it's more like a sum of the exponential function. So, so from here, you need to extract the, the first uh, lowest energy state. That is what, what you, you need to do. 
And in, in order to, to check that, we, we often define the so-called effective mass and plot as a function of the separation. And if you see the, the plateau, okay, this is the, the ground state energy. And this is a typical example of, for, for the nuclear energy. And, and okay, you see the plateau there, okay, I find the ground state the energy there and excited state energy there and so on. But you can see that, already see that there are statistical errors and, and depending on that, and where is the, the real uh, plateau is not always obvious. So, so that may be the source of the problem. So why are there such growing statistical error? Again, there, there is some theory about that. It's, it's easily understood. For instance, when, when you construct the pion correlator, that pion is a QQ bar state, so the quark propagator and its, its complex conjugate uh, uh, multiplied and to, uh, to produce the pion propagator. But nucleon, you combine three quark propagators uh, because the nucleon has a three quarks inside. So, so you combine the three quark propagators and you, you obtain a much heavier state. So much heavier state means a much uh, more rapid decays of the correlation function. So this one the rapidly decays the, while the pion is light, so it decays much slower. So at the very long distances, pion correlator is still large, but the nuclear correlator is, is very, very small. Several orders of magnitude smaller. But they are obtained from the same quark, quark propagator that means that for the nucleon, there are a lot of cancellations, numerical cancellations are going on. So that, that is the, essentially the reason why uh, the st statistical error becomes a problem, especially for nucleon. So, so the signal uh, vanishes rapidly as goes to, to the larger and larger separations, but Larger separations are more important in order to identify the ground state. So, so that is a problem. The no brute force solution to, to defeat exponentially growing the errors, that, that is the serious problem for, for many of us. So this is the, the typical example, nucleon axial charge. There have been the many calculations of the GA that is experimentally measured very precisely, 1.2723 with a very tiny error. And the lattice calculation was like this. The many, there are many calculations and all seems to be lower than the experimental number. And it looks like, but even if one takes the continuum limit, it stays lower than the experimental number. Why is it? it it is now understood that this is due to the uh, insufficient uh, isolation of the ground state because of the, the statistical problem. In order to, to suppress the excited state, you have to look at the long uh, correlation, uh, long separation. But going to the long, long separations, your signal is gone. So you need to keep your uh, correlation at short distances then you, 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 have the, you will have the uh, contamination from the excited state. That was the source of the, of the problem. There was a clever idea of, uh, of suppressing those effects, and finally uh, one gets this, uh, this Calodat 18 uh, third from the top is now has now a very precise number, and that is perfectly consistent with the PDG number that is shown by triangle down there. So in the end, the, the problem has been solved for this particular quantity, but there's a big lesson. 
about that. This is a very fundamental quantity, but still it, it has a very, this big problem. It, it means that we have to be very careful when, when you do the calculation of other more complicated quantities. Strong coupling constant is the subject of this workshop, and the status is like this. The, uh, I'm sorry, it's, it, it's tricky because this is not uh, physical observable, but uh, defined through some complicated relations. In the continuum, uh, or phenomenological determinations, one calculates using perturbation theory, the sum experimental number, uh, using the perturbation theory, and the perturbation theory con includes, uh, contains the strong coupling constant. So by using this uh, e equation, you obtain the alpha s. The, for the lattice, the, the principle is the same. Using the lattice calculation, we calculate some physical quantity, and using the perturbation theory for that particular quantity, uh, we have this equation, and then we can extract the strong coupling constant, and the status is like this. The, those are the colored points, uh, the, the lattice calculations, various lattice calculations, and the black points are the various uh, phenomenological determinations, and uh, they, they are all consistent, and the important thing is that now the sum of the lattice computation is more precise than, than the individual phenomenological determination. So, so the, now the lattice is leading the precision for this particular quantity. I have to be careful about saying that because there are many, <laughs> many experts in, in this room. That, that's about the strong coupling constant. Quark masses, they're similar for the, for the up and down quark masses. Lattice calculation is now very precise, so much more precise than, than any phenomenological determination. Uh, strange quark mass, charm quark mass, and bottom quark mass, for all of those, now the lattice is leading the precision. So I'm, I'm finishing. There are reasons to believe the, the lattice calculations, the uh, theoretical foundation is very solid, and uh, there is a unique continuum limit because of the renormalizable theory, and we, we do the, every effort to understand the systematic errors, and uh, of course there, there is a problem of the statistical errors, but we are steadily improving the precision for, for many quantities. So, customers, your opinion is important, and reasons not to believe, I'm not sure if there, there are other reasons not to believe lattice calculations, but if my talk is not convincing, please go ahead. If, if it was good enough, thank you for your attention. Um, so, is there any tension between these lattice computations and experiments? I mean, is there some indication that QCD may not be the correct theory? GA, nuclear and axial charge, was the, the, the most prominent example of that. But other, other than that, I, I don't know right now. There is no, no clear tension observed so far, I think, yeah. I have a question to your uh, baryon masses. Some of them are resonances with a relatively large uh, width. So if you define the mass on the lattice just with this exponential, how do you know which mass definition are you measuring? Okay. Um, strictly speaking, we are not allowed to extract the unstable baryon masses, uh, unstable hadron masses. They, they are not simple exponential, but some of the uh, various scattering states. 
from from there we are not able to reliably extract the the mass then instead of doing that we have to consider the the two body final state and have to study the scattering of those and by by looking at the scattering phase shift there, there was some example of that you you can uh, you can look at the phase shift going through the pi over 2 that from where you can identify the position of the resonance. That is what we should eventually do. So, so only the ground, ground state uh, hadrons can be treated. Yes, thank you. So, hi. Um, thank, thanks for your talk here. Ah. <laughs> um, so you talked about Euclidean uh, the, the lattice is in the Euclidean space, and I would like to, I would like you to speak a bit about how does these Euclidean quantities relate to Minkowski uh, quantities, and is this an issue somehow in the community? And yes. do other people yes. complain about this to you? Very good question, and actually, I have. My version of the reasons not to believe the lattice QCD calculations. For, for instance, uh, I don't trust the numerical computation or analysis may be subjective and uh, could be post-diction. But one of them, number five, is about the relation between the Minkowski and the Euclidean. And this is the basic assumption in, in many of the quantum field theory calculations. Uh, we, we assume that we are calculating the amplitude that, is, that can be analytically continued. So, so for the, for the two-point two correlation function, we, we know somehow it's analytic structure. And, and some place, some position of the of this this complex plane, there, there is a pole, and there are some places there are cuts, and and the Euclidean and, and Minkowski can be connected by the analytic continuation for for this particular two-point function. For for general uh, endpoint function, uh, the analytic continuation is much more complicated. And I don't, I don't think there, there is a general proof of that. So the short answer is that the, there is no mathematical proof that you can always do the weak rotation to, to do the calculation in the Euclidean space. But for some two-point functions or some simple quantities that, that is justified and you can trust the analytic continuation. Yes, there are reasons that we, we should not believe that is QCD. This is number five. Yes, thank you. Yes. Hi, here. So you focused on, on, on the, the ability of starting from the QCD Lagrangian to make predictions, right? To feed experiment, experimental data and, and make predictions. Uh, can you comment a little bit on, on, on how lattice QCD can help bring some qualitative understanding to uh, phenomena that arise from QCD? There are long-standing questions like confinement or, for instance, these exotic states in QCD, why they show up at a heavy sector of, QC, uh, of hadron physics and not you, you do not have multi-quark candidates on the l low end of the spectra or so, something like that. Yeah, so mostly I, I talked about the, the simplest the quantities, like the ground state hadron masses. And of course, there are important theoretical questions about confinement that, that may be related to the, the multi-hadron states. In the end, the QQ bar may split into the many, many states. So, so Necessarily, that is the multi-hadron uh, problem. But again, 
like another question, the treatment of multi hadron state is more challenging. It's, I'm not saying it's impossible, but but just more more challenging. You have to look at 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 the scattering among the different states to to answer that kind of question. For instance, the exotic state. That cannot be studied by just looking at the exponential fall off. You, you should look at the, the scattering state. After all, we are, we are working on the quantum field theory, so, so we need to prepare the uh, asymptotic state and what happens uh, in the end to the asymptotic state. That is the right question. So, so we need to prepare the uh, the ground state the hadrons or multiple hadrons and what happens through the interaction and what what is uh, how it looks like when the, you look at the exotic channel and so on so so some people and many people are actually interested in that quest that kind of questions and the studying but compared to those the simplest quantities that that's much more challenging because some more than one hadrons are involved. So it takes more time, but, but it's, it's being progressed. So, so I don't know, in, in several years, there will be a lot of results um, related to, to those questions, I think. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. <laughs> uh, yeah. A curiosity: Can, can we <clears throat> we discover like heavy um, mesons or baryons with lattice QCD? And if yes, the the obstacle for that is like uh, computational power. Can can we discover? No, not discover. I don't know, but predict heavy, maybe. Yeah, heavy <clears throat> mesons. Such as? No, not mesons, but uh, hadrons. Heavy hadrons. Yeah, I don't know, like higher resonances, I don't know. If the question is about the new type of quark, the answer is no. But the new kind of uh, bound state, the, that is possible. You, you know, we are doing the magic with we are, we are not doing any magic. <laughs> we, everything we input that, that we all know. So, 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 so nothing unknown will, will come out from the simulation. But, but certainly, the, in the multiple uh, hadron channel, the, the complicated things could happen, like, like the exotic states or the complicated scattering states and so on. So the, the, it's possible that, that one can obtain su such states that ha has not been observe, observed in the experiment yet, but, but Lattice can, can study it. That, that's, that's possible, certainly possible. But like other questions, it's, it's certainly more complicated. There is another uh, answer to that question. By Aida. I'm sorry. Thank you, uh, Shoji. I wanted to um, I wanted to add an answer to this question, as as you guessed, <laughs> um, because you asked about heavy states heavy mesons, and there is, in fact, a very nice story of the discovery of the B sub C yes. mesons, which were predicted with lattice QCD before they were discovered by CDF, um, right where they were predicted. And there is, in fact, still a prediction for the B sub C, for some of the um, excited states there that um, that were genuine lattice QCD predictions. And there are some other examples that, these are all examples that Shoji showed in his, his slides, 
where there are other predictions yeah, from lattice those. QCD on yeah. splittings and so on, not all of them have been measured. So that's perhaps mm -hmm. yes. a those, very compelling test. Those are not the surprise, because one can expect B sub C, uh, B C bar mesons. But anyway, that can be predicted and, and computed very precisely. And that was later confirmed by the experiment. That is a nice story. Yeah. Thank you. Another question. Is including the Higgs useful, or does it give any new, new idea? Um, first of all, I, I need to include weak interaction before well, the Higgs. Just the Higgs and the couplings of the Higgs to the quarks, just that. Higgs just so they get the mass from the Higgs instead of from the... Higgs is and, and the Yukawa interaction. Um, the the yes ground state must be the the just the standard quark quark masses and the excited state could be much heavier then that is uh, far away from the 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 energy scale that we can treat so the short answer answer is not not immediately maybe. 20 hours later, we need to include the weak interactions and the Higgs field and everything. Who knows? Yes. Any other question? OK, so let's thank Shoji again. Yeah, thank you very much. So there's some coffee and cake upstairs for people who want. Uh, I also would like to remind that the poster session of the workshop uh, is going to happen now around uh, close to the workshop.